All right, so uh, we're going to go ahead and change the schedule a little bit. Like I said, if things seem messed up, that's because they are. Um, we, we wrote the uh, material last week, so we're still sort of working through bugs in it. Um, so my section now is, was really sort of me going to everyone else in the project group and saying, I want to talk for a little bit. I, I put a lot of effort into this last year, and I was like, I just want to talk for a little bit. So whatever, whatever this section's called, uh, we have new scripts. I, I, I may veer off just because. <laughs> Um, so basically, what I wanted to kind of get across was sort of the stuff Robin hit on and other people have hit on. Bro always had this issue where it was really conceptually clean internally, and it had all these papers written and stuff. But it always surprised me, and I think the cluster paper was probably the first one that did it. None of these papers ever hit on the script land. The script land was like there, and it was like the key feature of Bro. But there was never anyone, because I think it was more of an operational concern than like a research concern, no one ever spent the time and said, let's make this clean and usable and just nice. Very, you know, make the experience of using Bro pleasant. Um, so, it, and I accidentally did that in the last year. Robin kept telling me to stop. Uh, he told me in, in numerous calls, he said, stop, <laughs> stop, stop messing with the scripts. Uh, and I, I didn't. And actually, two weeks ago, <laughs> it's fine. I, I'm all in the interest of full disclosure about everything, because I don't care. It's, it's an open source project. The bro dev list is available to anyone now. You see all the warts and flaws. Everything is available, because I don't care. <laughs> I, I've always found projects, though, that do this and are just very open about everything. I, I always feel more comfortable with them, and I enjoy looking at them more because you really get the sense that you know, the developers aren't interested in hiding their flaws. They're interested in fixing their flaws. And um, so the whole project has really moved that direction. Uh, years ago, it used to be that there was a bro dev list. No one knew about this list. It was hidden. And I, I used to get really confused, because what would actually happen is uh, the project would go for a while, and there'd be no release. And then all of a sudden, Bro 1.0 comes out. And it has all these, I looked through the changes log, and all this stuff's in it. And I'm like, where did this come from? There was nothing on the mailing list. And it turns out the hidden Bro dev list that LBL was running, there was a lot of discussion. And there were three papers that came out related to the thing. And, and it, it was confusing. And then it was me getting, having fun getting to read all the papers and finding out the new features and then learning the new scripts and stuff that had shown up. But it was always frustrating because the community was very opaque. But that's not, it's not like that anymore. It's warts and all. Anything you want to see is available. Um, and, and actually, yeah, if you even want to see our commit list so you can see all the commits we do, our Git repository, they're available. The other thing I really wanted to point out was um, all the scripts that are shipped with Bro now are completely and utterly and relentlessly driven from an incident responder's perspective. My perspective. So it's like there, there, there's probably there's probably some biases there that are wrong, and there are probably there's probably a lot of things there that are sort of wrong for your environment. But um, I talk to I make sure I talk to a lot of people in a lot of environments, and I try to solve other people's problems. So I'm not always trying just to solve my problems, and I'm hoping we're getting that direction. Uh, and, and that's all we can ever do is move in a direction. But I hope we're moving in the right direction. But really, I think from this point forward, I mean, assuming that we get funding and continue sort of this model of development into the future, um, it, it's, it, I think Bro is probably going to stay very focused on, from a release perspective around sort of this incident responder needs and things like that. Because I feel like one of the things the community has always lacked is someone sitting there saying, as an incident responder, we recognize that not every tool is perfect for you, and not every tool is perfect for your neighbor, but we could maybe build a tool that you can build your own tools with. And we can provide you a foundation that, that gets a lot of stuff in place already, so you just kind of hit the ball. And they, like, it's like the, we pitched it for you, now you just have to hit it. And, ho and hopefully, we're, we're really moving that direction. Um, so there, there's also this, and I don't know if you guys have looked at this or not, but the way the scripts are organized, um, for anyone who has a, OK, that's weird when people do tweets and I'm actually seeing them live while I'm talking. <laughs> um, it's weird. It's like an echo chamber I'm talking. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
that's, that's a new experience for me. Um, and actually, I think I might put this down now because I don't want to see that. <laughs> uh, they're, they're organized differently. This drove me crazy for years. And you know, sorry to the people that have worked on Bro for years prior to me. But it, it's, it was just sort of accumulation because there was never that like care and love that was put to the script layer. And like, I really care about it, and it matters to me. Um, so they had just been all kind of shoved in a directory because it's complicated to organize things. And everyone, you know, anyone in like incident response tries to like organize attacker groups or things like that. And it's always a lot of work to figure out like categories and how they all break down and what makes sense and whatever. And everyone fails at it because you know no model is ever going to correctly model uh, the reality. And we've sort of started to move that direction, but it was hard. We actually reorganized the scripts. And I'm just talking about like the directories they're sitting in and what they're named and conceptually how they're broken apart. We actually reorganized it three times, which was horrible <laughs> for the project because it broke everything we were doing. It broke bro control. It broke. It just broke everything. And we did this three times because we would reorganize them and say, "I don't like this," and then we would reorganize them again and say, "Well, you know, we'd work with that for three weeks and say, I don't actually don't like this." And we finally came to a point where I don't think anyone has complained about any major parts of the organization of the scripts, which is really nice. But you know, we were willing to break ourselves multiple times because we really wanted to get from this good base to sort of start with. Um, the, the new scripts also have a lot of extension points because it, it always drove me nuts. I'd be working on bro scripts, and I'd be like, I want to make it do this extra thing. And I'd be like, i got to modify the base script. You never modify the base scripts because you're just shooting yourself in the foot because you do an upgrade. Suddenly, upgrades go from simple to Impossible. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're going to become really, really hard. And sorry for everyone that has big LBL deployments of uh, 1.5 that Bro won't even work for right now because I didn't implement everything. They're missing features. It's a 2.0 release. It, it, it is what it is. Everyone always expects 2.0 releases have really rough edges. Well, you know, our 2.0 release has rough edges. We're hoping to fix a lot of those with 2.1. but. Uh, you know, it is that that is what it is. Um, so all the scripts really are written with this sort of eye towards extension, and I spent a lot of time on it and made sure and tried to write these scripts that extended the base scripts. And there are some cases, and there's a little bit of inconsistency still in the base scripts because what I actually did was I wrote them and rewrote. I know in one case it was one script I rewrote 15 times because. I didn't like the way I could extend it. I wanted to keep making it so I could extend it the way I wanted to. And it, it just it, it took a long time to sort of sort out these, I, these ideas. But there's been a lot of thought put towards how you extend the script. So what I really want to try and get across, and I, I think I'm ruining a slide I have for some other talk. But uh, if you ever like, need to, if you feel the need to modify one of the ship scripts, let us know. It means we probably failed somewhere in terms of extension, because I want it so you don't have to ever modify them. But, We'll see. Um, I don't know what time it is. I guess I have plenty of time since we sort of bumped everything forward. Um, so I really kind of wanted to go into three things. One of them gets talked about later on uh, in some detail. And it's not quite as much detail as I like. But the other two don't really get talked about a whole lot. And it's partly because they're new. And we haven't sort of mapped out the whole problem space yet. And there's a lot of extension that we have to do on those still. But we've sort of gone around this idea of frameworks where we want to provide APIs. I mean, novel concept, right? Provide like a real API to like do work, and, but do it at the bro script land, where in, instead of you know, saying, you have to do everything yourself, it's like, we're going to give you capabilities. We're going to hide implementation within those frameworks. And, and there's some discussion about this later. Some of these frameworks actually work transparently on a cluster because we hid the cluster implementation details internally. So you just load it, and it says, is the cluster framework enabled? And if it is, then it works differently. But you don't care. It's, it's going to try and do the right thing. And it probably doesn't do exactly the right thing, but it's much better than you know, not having it at all. So the three parts in particular were the logging framework, the metrics framework, and the intelligence framework. The logging framework was. Uh, was defined over a period of, I don't know, I, I suppose really the definition of that probably started about four or five years ago when I started writing these dash ext scripts for Bro. And a lot of the people that run 1.5 deployments run these dash ext scripts because they have that same tab separated output that you saw from the exercise. Um, 
it, and, and they sort of move away from this model of the old bro script. You would say, I saw something, and immediately when you saw it, it just logs it. But the problem is, is that you'll have all these attributes of one connection, and it'll be over a bunch of lines. And so log parsing is a total mess. So the new thing is sort of store state, and then when, when, that, log, when that unit that you want to log is done, then go ahead and write it out. But so it's been a long time, but then Robin and I actually had these phone calls that extended. It was, what was it, last October, November, something like that? We had these phone calls, and we do our weekly, I don't know what it's supposed to be, we had an hour scheduled, I think, but we had these calls, and they sort of extended to two hours, and then two and a half hours, and we like defined the entire logging framework, implemented it, and it was done, and it's been done for months and months and months. But what it does is it's cool, because it moves Bro to this notion of, all output is key value pairs, everything. There, there's really there's one script that we'll ignore. Let's pretend it doesn't exist. There's one script that is different, but everything else is all key value pairs. It's, it, it's a database, in a sense, and these log files are self-descriptive. I mean, there, there's just it, it's a very different approach to logging. But then extending that, not everyone can log the same thing. And this came from my experience in higher ed. At a, a, the Ohio State University, where I used to work, we weren't allowed to log, or at least we internally we took the approach that we were not even going to try it, uh, logging outbound HTTP requests. So things that the users are doing. Because I did not want to see the stuff the users were doing. I did not want to see it. So we, we, we started doing that. And with my old EXT scripts, I did it in a very uh, non-flexible way, and it was like a feature that was like it split the logs in the inbound and outbound, and you could turn off one of them. The new logging framework is crazy in terms of the flexibility. You can dynamically generate file names at runtime. So you could like, for HTTP, the example I gave a couple people earlier was you could have a separate log file instead of just having HTTP.log. You could say if the server in it is a local address, I want to take the host name that was requested and have you know www.somesite.com.http.log, and then anything that shows up, you're going to have a separate log file for. And Bro actually works okay, so that you could have a thousand log files, and you're not going to bump into like uh, open file limits because Bro actually manages all of that internally, and it'll close files and open them, and you don't have to worry about it. It just sort of deals with it. I believe that's correct. There's probably some limit, and if you <laughs> That, so that's the problem. We gave all flexibility. So it's like a, a, as infinitely flexible as you could want it to be. The problem is, is that you know you can sh we're giving you the gun. Feel free to shoot yourself in the foot. I mean, you can have a million logs and screw stuff up. But fr from our perspective, as an open source project, and we want to just give people tools, you have to give people the gun, and some of them are going to shoot themselves in the foot. But you know, live and learn. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, you can actually modify also the logs. So like say you have some log. Um, SMTP log is a good example. Um, by default, it logs the subject of the email by looking through the email and pulling the subject out. If you can't log that, it's easy to say, remove that field from the log. And that field won't be in your SMTP log anymore. And that's actually something you don't modify the base script. You just tell it, I cut this field out. You can go the other way, too, by adding extra fields in your own script that is separate from the base scripts. You can add your own fields and fill them out and put data in them, and they get logged. And you have extra data in your logs. So uh, I guess a good example of that is, doesn't everybody want kind of extra metadata? OK, I saw uh, an HTTP request, and I saw an HTTP response. Great, that's one log line, because it's the, that request response pair. I have a script, and I haven't ported it to 2.0, so this is all sort of just ignore this for a second from a practical standpoint. It, it tries to identify browsers that are lying by looking at the header orders. And it says, this browser said that it's IE7. However, it didn't do the headers in the correct order. And it didn't include the right headers and stuff like that. Well, that's a Boolean value. This browser appeared to be lying, or this browser didn't appear to be lying. Wouldn't it be nice in your logs if you could literally just say, show me all the requests, response pairs, where the browser appeared to be lying? And it's, it's just a little piece of metadata. It barely extends your logs. But you guys could literally write that script, not touch the base scripts, 
And it's an extra piece of metadata that you could match on. Literally, you could actually take that and then filter that into a separate log file or stick that alone into a database if we had the output plugin for that. Because the, the logging framework is actually plugin based. Um, and we're going to be adding, uh, for 2.1, I think we'll probably add binary logs in this. Don't worry about that. It's coming. Binary logs, much, much smaller and flexible. But um, yeah, so you get kind of this notion where it's like, if you come up and you're like, locally, this matters to me, you can kind of do that and add bits of metadata into these logs if you think of something interesting you'd like to collect. And it also sort of, uh, one of the big extension points here is it separates the notion of logging and then handling the logs. Because you, there's like the place where you put the logs in and, and the, the base script is saying, I'm ready, log it. And then there's the other part where you as the user stands back and says, OK, it shoved it into the logging framework. What do I want to do with that? Because that's where it becomes important. And a lot of times, people want to stick things in a database because you can do indexing, and it's faster. And Elsa is going to be great for that, I'm hoping, <laughs> that, that Martin's presenting later. And um, what if you didn't even need to do that? What if you could just say, well, you know, the things I'm going to look for are Windows executables downloaded over HTTP. Well, you can actually put a logging filter in that says, keep my whole normal HTTP log, but I also like to extract the ones that are Windows executables and put them in a separate log file, because you can grep that. That's quick. It's like, who cares? You just grep it. It's easy to manage. You don't need to set up any other systems. You get to use grep. And who doesn't want to use grep? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, the, the logging framework is an enormous feature. And it really enabled a lot of our uh, flexibility in terms of extension and things like that. It really unexpectedly did that, too. Robert and I didn't anticipate, when we started doing like the design discussions on it, we didn't anticipate where it was going. And it ended up at a very cool place. Um, so the metrics framework. This isn't getting talked about here. It's, it's pretty primordial still. But it works. And there's actually a detection that's using it in Bro. And there's a few example scripts. Um, it's basically measuring things. I mean, that's all it does right now is it says plus one, plus one, plus one. We, but we actually approached it with a very similar approach to the logging framework. Um, it separates the notion of saying plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one from the notion of what do I want to do with this? And if you think about uh, metrics, they're sort of like, how do you want to aggregate your data? Do you want to aggregate your, your, uh, your IP addresses into like subnets? Or do you want to, um, or, or do you want to? I guess that's that's really the only aggregation we have right now. But you could like, you could say like, uh, how many? You could ask Bro the question, you know, and this is sort of the high level thing that would have to be turned into, you know, code and configuration. But you could say, how many HTTP requests do I have per local slash twenty four per hour? And that's something that you can answer. It's sort of a, a dumb thing to answer, but you know, from a simple example, it's a pretty easy example to wrap your head around. But because we split the notion of putting data into the metrics framework and then using the data, you can actually collect multiple metrics from that. Say you want to know not only the hourly value so that every hour this value comes out, what if you also want a five minute value? You can actually do both of those at the same time because this notion of putting data in and getting data out is two separate things. And that's sort of pervasive across all the new APIs that we have in various bro scripts. Um, and, and it's one of the extension things, because you have to separate this notion. The base scripts always just put data in. And then they leave it up to you to figure out what you want to do with that. They may have some default thing that they will do, but you can take that out and, make, and do really whatever you want with it. Um, there's also the ability to do like thresholding. So you, you can, because you can think about, you know, I'm collecting this metric. If anything ever crosses 10,000, let me know. And that, that's just easy to set. It's basically configuring your metrics filters to say, you know, here's this thing, generate this notice if anything ever happens. <coughs> um, there's the intelligence framework. And this isn't getting talked about a lot, but I have high hopes for this. But this is even more primordial than the metrics framework, unfortunately. Uh, it's really just querying for simple bits of intelligence, IP addresses, CIDR blocks, um, a file MD5 sums. Uh, email addresses, all sorts of stuff. It separates that notion again. You put data into the intelligence framework. I'm hoping that people don't care how that's stored internally. Just know that querying the intelligence framework 
is really, really fast. This is actually one of the things, and it took me a long time to sort of rectify this in my head as, as something really, really good. Because Bro came out of the research community, Vern always seemed to have this, this big focus on constant time. Everything constant time. You could have a list of you know, a million, and actually I did this at OSU, a list of a million things, and it's constant time. It doesn't matter how many things are in the list, but to say, is something in this, sorry, I guess you use proper terminology not to confuse things, it's a set. And you say, is something in this set of data, strings, IP addresses, whatever, it, it's constant time. It, is that correct that it shouldn't matter how many things are in the list in any case? The cider lookup might be a little different, but it, it's fast anyway, because it's doing prefix matching. But yeah, they're, they're hash lookups, so it doesn't matter how many things are in it. And it kind of threw me for a loop, because I had come from like scripting languages, which are not implemented sort of so academically clean and whatever. But I feel like that's kind of a critical point to Bro, is that it has this like soft real-time constraint, so you can't, you don't get the flexibility to be like, but we need back referencing and regular expressions. If it's not constant time, you probably don't want to do it. So it's, it's kind of got all these uh, almost limitations built into the language, but they're there for a reason. And it's because we're trying to, I, I get the sense it was always Vern didn't want people to shoot themselves in the foot too easily. Like you can do these things and have these enormous sets and you can match against them and you can be pleasantly surprised that you can match against you know, a thousand times a second against the set that has a million items in it. And you go, oh, it didn't even change performance. It, it actually didn't impact us at all. Um, so yeah, it, it's really just for querying simple bits of intelligence. So it's, it, I think the way it works, I hate to say this because I wrote it, but I think the way it works is you basically attach tags. So you have an IP address and you'd say, well, it's malicious. Um, you can give a description to it, so you can be like, you know, from the maybe from the data source you got the data from. You can be, we saw this as a botnet controller, um, uh, just stuff like that. And then on the other side, when you query, you may just say, I'm looking for malicious IP addresses, and here's the IP address I have, you know, because I saw an HTTP request, and I want to know if it's a malicious IP address. And, and then it could come back, and the intelligence framework may come back to you and say, yes, it is. And then you take the next step and say. Can I have these bits of metadata associated with it? So then you can maybe dig a little deeper and say, uh, you, you know, why was this considered malicious? Or what was the data source where all of this data came from? And, and it could be multiple data sources. And the, I, I kind of wanted to also mention, the API has not been extensively tested, unfortunately. So it's very likely the API for that's going to change, hopefully get better. But I, I don't see anyone using it really extensively before we do. <laughs> And we're going, to be, we're going to be getting scripts in the base distribution maybe for the final of 2.0. I don't know yet. It's feature freeze, but I've added things before. <laughs> um, so sorry, Robin. But, um, so I, I really kind of just wanted to, to talk about that, just the general approach to, to a lot of the new scripts and how you know, the, the project is really, really different. I mean, it, you, it, anyone who's played with the older versions of Bro, and I know there are some people because you had them installed on your laptops and it was causing problems, um, it's, it's such a different project now. And just right out of the bat, I mean, you'd see, you're like, oh, I don't have to, I just tell it, read a trace file, and it tells me stuff. I mean, it's, it's just a big change. So I really wanted to just get across the point that, you know, we're trying to apply sort of the same rigor that's always been applied at Bro's core to the scripting land. And uh, I, I think it's working out. Um, I guess we can move on to the next thing. I don't think there's a break here, is there? Okay. All right. So this is Gilbert Clark, former ICSI intern extraordinaire from last summer. Who? I don't know about extraordinaire, but whatever. He, he, he threaded the logging framework. We're hoping to get that released in 2.1 so that we'll have the logging framework threaded, which turns out there are places they're logging so much data, and you know who you are that it's crashing the manager because there are so many logs going to the manager. 